miles of barbed wire I got a cobra sink for a necktie A brand new house on the roadside It's made out of human skull And a brand new chimney that I put on top It's made out of human skull Come on, take a little walk with me, child Tell me who do you <laughs> I love Vince and the band, but seriously, that is a weird song for an offertory, isn't it? I mean, why did you pick that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I just was researching this week for some reason, I don't know why, but there are like 73 renditions of that song um, since Bo Diddley first wrote it and recorded it back in the 50s sometime or something. And then there are all these songs that that's the title, that uh, the songs are different. It's almost like that question, who do you love, is like the most asked question in the universe. Is, is that weird or what? So let's pray. So, Father, we ask that you would help us to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Long about the 5th century B.C., a fellow named Parmenides said, I don't know, he was at a bar somewhere, I don't know, but he said, he said, what is, is, and what is not, is not. Correct? You'd, you'd agree with that? So, what is cannot be divided and cannot move. What is cannot be divided, for imagine if what is could be divided, what would separate what is? Either a piece of what is or a piece of what is not. If it is what is that separates what is, then what is is not divided. On the other hand, if it is what is not that separates what is, then what is not is separating what is, which is to say what is not is. But we already agreed that what is is and what is not is not, and if what is not is is, then, then what is, is undivided. So what is, is undivided? It's one. And, said Parmenides, what is cannot move. For imagine if what is could move, where would what is move to? What is not? Well, then, we'd be saying what is not is the place to which what is moves. Yet what is not cannot be a place that is, for as we agreed, what is is and what is not is not. So what is cannot move. And so logically, if you are divided and you move, you must be what is not. Heraclitus, another Greek guy, said, cut it out, Parmenides, you're giving me the willies. It's obvious that the only thing that doesn't change is the truth that everything changes. That's Heraclitus. Well, there's something rather attractive about the God of Parmenides. I mean, if God is what is, undivided and unmoving, he might, you know, leave me alone something attractive about that, and something a little bit terrifying because he might leave me alone. The reason the mass of men dislike God and at the bottom fear him, wrote Herman Melville, is that they imagine him all brain like a watch. That's all perfection and no passion. Likewise, there's something rather attractive about the God of Heraclitus, for if you don't like God, you know, maybe he'll move, maybe he'll change. There's something attractive about that, something terrifying as well. I mean, have you ever dated someone that's all change? And only passion? Parmenides believed in what is and what never changes. 
Heraclitus believed in the unchanging logic of constant change. He referred to this as the logos and argued that everything that's anything is fire. Plato suggested that neither Parmenides nor Heraclitus were completely insane. Plato argued that there is a realm of what is, but that we live in what is not with a vague memory of what is. You see, I think he learned that from his teacher, Socrates. Plato pointed out that a shadow is what is not, produced by what is. A shadow is what is, not light. Plato's student was Aristotle. Aristotle referred to what is as the unmoved mover. If you think of everything that moves, okay, think of that, just right now, do it. Think of everything that moves, and then ask yourself, what moved everything that moves? He'd say, well, that would be the unmoved mover, the uncreated creator, necessary beingness, what is, that is. So the big questions for the Greeks were, how could what is know a what is not like me? And how is a what is not like me ever know, could ever know uh, what is? How and why would an unmoved mover move to create an apparently unnecessary being like me? That is what is, what is not. <laughs> that is me. What could possibly be his logic, his reason, his logos in, in Greek? Well, all that philosophy might have stayed in Greece, except that a student of Aristotle named Alexander conquered the known world, including a small nation of wild-eyed fanatics that worshiped I am that I am, Yahweh, I am that I am, which sounds an awful lot like what is undivided and unchanging, that is unmoving, and yet this I am that I am moved. He spoke creation into existence with a word, and this logos was fire, and he and his words seemed to be incredibly passionate about us, about what is, what is not, that is me. How that could be was a mystery, at least until Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am, ego in me, like I am that I am, the light of the world. You know, physicists now tell us that a photon of light does not experience the passage of time. It just is what is, eternal, undivided. Well, God is light, and Jesus is the light of the world, uh, according to John, and, and Jesus referred to us as children of light, destined to inherit eternal life. That's the life of the age that is, the age that, that is. And so in space and time, we are like what is not and divided, destined to be filled with what is and what is undivided. Well, if in eternity, the age that is, you actually are what is, like God, and you were to know who God is and what you are, perhaps it might be necessary to watch yourself become. But of course, this would be quite a challenge while you were in fact becoming, for you would necessarily not know what you actually are. Except that somebody might tell you, you are what is not, observing yourself as you become what is. In other words, you are a false self observing yourself as you become a true self. You're a shadow self being filled with eternal light, the light of the age that is. It would be like watching yourself being born as you were being born from the perspective of the baby, like as if you were being born again. And Jesus said you must be born again, or, or it can also be translated, you must be born from above. He is the firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead, firstborn from this womb of space and time. Faith in him is his eternal life, the life of the age that is already in you. Whoever believes in me, whoever has faith in the Son has eternal life, 
the life of the age that is, said Jesus. That is just too much to think about, right? So just forget it. Stop thinking about it. Forget it. Uh, My point this morning is actually very simple, and that is that Jesus likes to go on walks. Thousands of years of philosophy and religion, then the unmoved mover appears in human flesh, and what does he want? Wants to go on a walk. The word, the logos, was with God, that's I am that I am, Yahweh. The word, the logos was with God, I am that I am. The word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and said to these 12 guys, come on, take a little walk with me, baby, and tell me who do you love? A who? And check this out. It turns out that this behavior on the part of God is nothing new. Last week we started talking about the way in which God creates faith in Adam, that is humanity, so that Adam would love God in God's own image. Last week we preached on the story of Cain and Abel, that is Hebel, Abel, which means uh, breath. We, We said that faith is like breathing. Faith is a decision to lose yourself and then find yourself filled with the breath of God. It's a decision to expire, expiritus, expire, and be inspired by what is <laughs> eternal and undivided. Faith is the breath of God in you. Or, actually, God breathing you because you are his breath in an earthen vessel. You are what is in what is not. Well, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, listen to a snake, and they take the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, and then they hide from each other, and they hide from God, they hold their breath. God finds them, remember, and he kicks them out of the garden, and yet, as we saw last week, this is a shock to a lot of people, he goes with them. Genesis 4, verse 3, at at the end of days, that's a literal translation, Cain and Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve, each make offerings to the Lord who's, who's with them. Cain, which means I possess, is then condemned to wonder. And Abel, which means breath, is lifted. At the end of days, we must each surrender our flesh, that is, our ego, our Cain, in order that our Hebel, our spirit, might be lifted into the lungs of God. We come to the end of days, the end of ages, whenever we come to Jesus. That's what scripture says. At the end of the ages, Jesus, he's the end. He causes us, he causes us to breathe. You you know, you have to breathe to keep walking. Then Genesis, then Genesis 5.1, listen closely. This is the book of the generations of Adam, translated, which means mankind. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them Adam. In the day, they were created. So this day, May 23rd, 2021, is still that day. Until the end of days. And that means these ancient stories about far more than freaky, weird, ancient, mythical people. Somewhere in the distant past, these stories are a description of your own creation in the sixth day of creation. For on the seventh day, it is finished. And everything, everything is good. Genesis 5, 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him, him Seth. Seth means I appointed, kind of like I have chosen. Cain means, uh, 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 Cain means I have chosen. Seth means um, you have chosen or God has chosen. Anyway, 5-6, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. 5-9, when Enosh lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. 5-12, when Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Enoch means dedicated 
were trained up, and Enoch is the seventh generation, as if Adam has been walking for six days and then arrived at seven, which is Enoch, who is then lifted at the end of almost like a thousand years, 987 years, which is about a thousand years, which is as a day in God's reckoning. Verse 21, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years, which is kind of an interesting number too, right? Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Dang. Enoch didn't die. Remember what Jesus said, whoever believes in me has faith, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. (laughs) Enoch had what the first Adam lacked in the garden, faith. Enoch walked with God and God took him, it is finished, Enoch is finished. In seven generations, Enoch, son of Adam, is created in the image of God. In three more generations, Noah is saved by God. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Remember, faith is reckoned as righteousness, right? Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Only three people in the Old Testament are said to walk with God. Enoch walked with God, and God just took him. Noah walked with God, and God saved him. Levi, the high priest, walked with God, according to God in Malachi 2. But apparently, he was the only priest um, that, that did. And then when Jesus, our high priest and savior, the eschatos, Adam, appears, when God in flesh appears, what does he want to do? What does he do? He finds 12 guys. And he says, come on, take a little walk with me, baby. And tell me, who do you love? Uh, who? They just walk around for three years till God takes everyone home. At the end of the sixth day, the edge of the seventh day, it is finished. It is finished, says Jesus, from the tree in the middle of the garden. And on the third day, he is, he is lifted, but he comes back, and what does he do? He, he goes for a walk. Remember, with two of his disciples on the way to Emmaus. I'm just saying that God, the unmoved mover, really wants to go for a walk. With Adam, that is us. And he seems incredibly passionate about this. As if somewhere in the past he was like stood up on a date. And hopefully remember that he was stood up on a date. Genesis 3, 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And we were hiding. It's interesting that the cool of the day is literally the ruach, the ruach of the day, the wind of the day, the spirit of the day in in Hebrew. So it's a crazy picture because God is walking. I mean, he's got legs in Genesis chapter 3. God in flesh invites humanity, Adam, to go walking in his own spirit. As if in him and in in him we live and move and have our being. God, the three in one, invites us to go for a walk, and we're all hiding. We think God is hiding but maybe we're hiding. God is love. His word is truth, and both are light. Do you ever hide from love or truth or light? In other words, do you ever choose the shadow? Do you sin? Well, when God speaks to Abraham, remember what he does, takes him on a walk. When God appears to Moses in Israel, he takes him on a walk. They think he's hiding in the tabernacle, but maybe they're hiding from him. And you know, he's like all around them, in the midst of them, and even going before them all the time. When Jesus appears to his disciples at the end of Matthew, he says, and lo, I'm with you always, wherever you walk. 
Maybe your life is a walk. And your soul is the tabernacle. And God is all around you and going before you and even behind you, but your eyes are shut because you don't trust that he's good. Maybe God never stopped walking with Adam. He followed Adam out of, out of the garden, we've seen it. Well, it's Adam that must have stopped walking with God. God's walking with you. But are you walking with him? Come on, take a little walk with me, child, and tell me who do you love? Who do you love? You see, I think that's what he was asking Adam in the garden before he made him male and female, before Adam talked to the snake, before Adam took the fruit from the tree. He was asking, who's your helper, Adam? Who do you love, Adam? And when Adam didn't answer, he took us all on a walk. When someone says, hey, let's go for a walk, what do they want, really? When, when, when someone says, would you go for a walk with me, number one, it's not about where you go, but who you're with. So I've told you years ago, I led this uh, a group from our old church to visit our sister church in the Dominican Republic. And my dad went on that trip, and then Susan and the kids uh, met us at the airport. And I'll never remember what Becky did. This is back in the days you could go to the terminal. You know? <laughs> she came running up to me. She was about three or four at the time. She came running up to me, and I just remember she jumped on me, wrapped her arms around me, and said, oh, Daddy, 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 I'm so glad to see you. I was scared you would get lost. But then I remembered you couldn't get lost because you were with your daddy. <laughs> Jesus said, you must become like a little child to enter. You see, little children don't navigate with maps. They navigate with the presence of a person that they have come to trust. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the way, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you right now. But are you with him? If you're with the way, you cannot be lost. The way is how it is walked. The, the road is how it is walked, wrote Soren Kierkegaard. We, we always worry about God's direction, you know? I mean, because people ask me this, and I ask this constantly. Should I go this way? Should I go that way? Solomon says, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make straight your path. Do you realize that your Father, who is one undivided and eternal, speaks reality into existence with a word called the way. So it's not a big deal for him to move the earth under your feet to make your path straight, whether you go this way or that way. But he hung on a cross in order to get you to trust him. Number two, you go for a walk not to get to a place, but a person. And check this out. When you go for a walk, the beginning is also the end. And both are a person. And yet, after the walk, you know the person and the place in a new way. And so T.S. Eliot wrote this, And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, unremembered gate. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the presence of your Father. Jesus is the parakletos in Greek, and he sends his spirit, which is also called the parakletos. It's translated helper in the ESV, and it literally means called alongside. One who walks with you. In the beginning, you left a, a garden with a tree in the middle of that garden, in the end, you will return to the same place and know it for the first time. It has an inner sanctuary that contains the judgment of God. 
and an outer sanctuary where what is mingles with what is not. It's a garden, but not simply a garden. Anyway, number three. The things you encounter on your walk are the raw material of relationship. You know, when you get with friends and family, what do you do? You remember shared experiences, right? Remember when we had no money, but we had each other? Remember what you said to me that day in the hospital? Remember where I was and what I was doing when you told me I'm pregnant? Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. You know, as if it's like a shared experience. A communion, if you will. Number three, the things you encounter on your walk are the raw material of relationship, even storms and snakes. Especially storms and snakes. Two years ago, my son Coleman, my new daughter, new daughter-in-law, Natalie, they invited me and Natalie's dad on a three-day backpacking trip through Canyonlands in April, start of April, okay? At the trailhead, Coleman said, Dad, you don't need a heavy coat. It's not gonna rain. It's not gonna be cold, it's gonna be warm. First night, there was an absolute downpour. I mean, it was like one hell of a storm. We all snuggled together under this tarp, wondering if we would seriously die of hypothermia. And for the next three days, I think Coleman almost did die because he kept giving me his coat. He sacrificed for me. And now I'm grateful for the storm. Because see, it's how I got to know my new family, snuggled together under that tarp, and how I encountered new and wonderful depths in the heart of, of my son. <laughs> this is Elizabeth and uh, Becky on a hike someday, I don't know when, years ago. Elizabeth and Coleman were our two strong-willed children. For Christmas, no lie, Elizabeth wanted a punching bag and a snake. She wanted a snake, a live snake, because she was constantly trying to prove how tough she was. She wanted a snake for a pet until one day in the front yard, along with Becky, walking through the grass, she managed to get a garter snake stuck in the toes, in, under her toes in her flip-flop that she was wearing, and went running down the street screaming, trying to get away from the snake. But of course, the poor little snake went with her because it was stuck in her flip-flop. I hate snakes, but I'm grateful for her encounter with the snake, for then she started calling on me to deliver her every time there was a garter snake in the yard. I became her helper, her savior, that day. You may remember that on Israel's journey through the wilderness, they encountered a lot of storms. I mean, the Egyptian army, warring tribes, human skulls everywhere. Even God appeared in a storm, as, as a storm. They encountered storms, and when they wouldn't stop complaining, remember what they encountered? Snakes, fiery serpents. Until God told Moses to have them look at a bronze serpent lifted on a pole. John 3, 14, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so it is necessary for for the Son of Man to be lifted up, that everyone believing in him may have eternal life, life of the age that is. Lifted up, it's there that he destroys the work of the devil. And now he sings, I walk 47 miles of barbed wire, got a cobra snake for a necktie, Who do you love? Tombstone hand, graveyard, mine. Just 33 and I don't mind dying. Uh, Who? Who do you love? I hate snakes. But I am actually, I think, becoming grateful for all my encounters with the snake. If I never encountered the snake, I might never ever have seen Jesus high and lifted up. 
And so I might never ever have known who loves me and who it is that I love. I might never have known my helper. And so I might have remained forever alone. That is forever not good. Perhaps none of the snakes that you've encountered were simply there by accident including the one we all encountered at the beginning in the outer court of the garden. Well, number four, no two walks are just the same. I've gone for a walk, you know, with each of my kids, often at the same time, and yet each of their experiences were entirely different because they are entirely different. Every Israelite followed the pillar of fire and cloud, but every Israelite had a different experience. We idolize each other's experiences. Have you noticed that? We idolize each other's walks, and so we take the living God who wants to have a unique relationship with each of us, and we turn him into a formula or a a map that we can manipulate and use to help ourselves and judge our neighbor, but he's not a map. Sorry, I shouldn't yell. He's not a map. He's a person who loves you, your helper. No two walks are just the same, and yet number five, the one we walk with remains the same. Eternal, undivided, and true. God is love, his word is truth, and both of them are light. Now you may be thinking, I don't know if there is a God, because I don't see him, I don't hear him, walking next to me? Well, do you see love? Did you think that that was just a chemical in your brain? Do you hear truth? Did you think that was just a thought that you thunk in in your brain? A thought that you can then manipulate to get what you want. Are you drawn to the, to the light that is truth and love, the glory of, of grace, the light? Scientists, you know, are utterly baffled by light. Is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, maybe it's not two, but one. And we are two, not one, but two. Maybe love, truth, and light are undivided and we are thoroughly divided. Perhaps they are what is and we kind of are what is not. Whatever the case, according to scripture, neither love, truth, nor light is a thing but a person. Perhaps you take his life from the tree in every moment that you don't believe. And perhaps you receive his life from the tree in every moment that you do believe. Perhaps he's arranged everything so that you would come to believe. All things work together for good with those who love God and are called according to his purpose, wrote Paul. His purpose is to make you in his own image and likeness. And so he foreknew you, predestined you, called you, justified you and even glorified you and he'd like you to know so you would believe. Number six, the one you walk with changes the way you walk and whether or not you keep walking at all. I have a dear friend, m- many of you know my friend, she said I could say her name but you, you might know her. She, she's a part of our church, struggles with alcohol. Many years ago, she went on a drinking binge and found herself utterly ashamed and alone in a hospital room in a detox ward. She writes, Peter, I have never told anyone this, and I asked her if I could share this yesterday. She wrote to me, Peter, I've never told anyone this. When I finally made it to my room that night that my parents delivered me to detox, I saw a vision. I saw Jesus. You might scoff that I was merely a drunk hallucinating, but I recall this image with great clarity. When I saw him, I said, what are you doing here? He answered, you brought me with you. I remember thinking the next day that if that was true, then he was there when I got drunk, when I couldn't walk, when I tried to drink my own urine, just trying to get more alcohol in the detox ward. 
when I tried to drink my own urine, he was in me, and I was in him. See, it changed the way she walked, for she believed that God is good to her, for her, in her, with her, and now she, she does, she helps other people walk like me, and she hasn't stopped. I know another woman who, who used to be a part of our church who, who decided one day to bag her faith, run from Jesus, give in to her own self-destructive passions. She was sitting in an appointment at a sex club as a submissive talking to, in a, in a, to a dominant uh, arranging play when this dominant said to her, I think God is chasing me down. At that, my friend heard Jesus in the sanctuary of her own soul, and she cried out, what are you doing here? And through his spirit, he answered, you brought me here. It changed the way she walked. She walked out of that place and into the arms of Jesus. She used to say, Peter, Peter, just tell people that they can talk to Jesus wherever they are. I pray for several friends that have gotten stuck in the most horrifying moments of space-time and demonic oppression, and they get unstuck when, they, when, when they've gotten unstuck when, when they realize that Jesus was with them and is still with them and will not leave them nor forsake them, and he is the way. Hell is for people that stop walking with love, truth, and light. But you see, love, truth, and light will not stop walking with them. When they come to see the glory of what is shining in the midst of what is not, they will trust what is and begin walking once again in the light. So when you're walking through hell, don't stop. Keep walking. Jesus is the way, the truth, the resurrection, and the life. Number seven, it takes a walk to create a faith. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that walking just forces you to breathe? It takes a walk. 41 years ago, this girl Susan kept asking me to go on a walk. I pretended that I wasn't hearing her in order to have time to buy a ring and ask her to go on a walk. 38 years ago this Friday, we agreed to go on this walk together. Wasn't sure where we're going, but we agreed to walk together. I must admit that I was initially drawn to the idea because I could see that she was good for food and a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise. I mean, everybody said, Peter, you'd be a fool not to marry her. Initially, I suppose I wanted to take her life, but on this 38-year walk, I've watched her constantly give her life. <laughs> I mean, really lose her life for, for, for me, and now I trust her. I have faith in her. I believe in her and through her. But now, suppose I said, you know what? I have decided. I've decided to trust my wife, and this faith that I have in her is really quite impressive of me. Oh yeah, it's been hard, it's been a struggle, but I did it, I believe, in Susan. You would be right to wonder, does Peter trust Susan, or trust Peter in the name of Susan? Does Peter trust Jesus or trust Peter in the name of Jesus? Is Peter the imitation Christ, <laughs> the antichrist? Whew. Get my point? Faith is something that your helper creates in you by taking you on a walk and, and helping you when you need help. So if you boast in your faith in your helper, you actually don't have faith in your helper, but faith in yourself, the imitation Christ, the antichrist. And you're alone. Even though he's with you. <laughs> In the beginning, we were alone, and that's not good. We didn't know our helper and had no faith in our helper, and so, of course, we couldn't find our helper. God is our helper, and so our helper arranged for us to go on a walk with him. 
We left the realm of what is to walk through what is not. We left God's age to walk through space and time. We left undivided truth, love, and, and light to walk in shadows. And we are now walking through the valley of the shadow of death that we might learn to trust the way, the truth, and the life, our helper. We will trust our helper when we see that his judgment is good. His judgment is and has always been salvation. At a certain point on our journey, we will each come to see that although we have always taken his life, he has always given his life. Salvation. It's this knowledge that produces faith which brings us home. Number eight. You go on a walk so that when you get to the end, which is the beginning, you'll know the place for the first time, for you'll know your helper as you've never known him before. You know, it's getting to the point where almost anywhere I go, well, except maybe Bed Bath and Beyond, but it's getting to the point where almost anywhere I go with Susan is good. And I've discovered that my helper lives in Susan. And I'm starting to see that anywhere I go with him is heaven. Adam, that is humanity, will return to the garden and know it for the first time. Now listen closely. This is impossible for me to describe or even comprehend because what I'm about to say transcends space and time. And right now we're in space and time. Eternity in our hearts in space and time. You will see that the beginning is the end and also the way. You will see that the garden is also a tabernacle and a temple. You will see that it was with you on your walk the entire time. And you will see that this temple is a city, and you will see that this city contains an entire new creation. That's an old creation made new. And you will see that this new creation is also a body, and you will see that this body is the body of your helper, and you will see that this body is you, for you are his body and his bride. Adam, that is humanity, will return to the garden and know it for the first time, for we'll know him for the first time, and he will fill all things. So you see, the garden isn't simply a place, it's a person. To be technical, theologians would say he is three persons and one substance. He's the unmoved mover who is constantly moving. He is love. Love is unchanging, undivided, and constantly moving. Love is a noun, the unmoving foundation of all reality, and love is a verb, the sacrifice of self for another. Love is a dance. Love is also the act of dancing. Love is eternal life. Love is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit constantly dancing. Three persons unified in one eternal unchanging decision, one choice, one judgment, made in perfect freedom called love. And this is love. So in the garden, in the beginning, in the spirit of the eternal day, the Lord went for a walk. But I suspect that it was really more like a, a dance, and he would like us to join him. But we didn't know him, so we could not freely choose him. And to really join a dance, you must freely decide to dance, and that decision is called faith. And so, he took us on a walk. And on that walk, when we do our worst, he reveals his best. When we make bad judgments, he reveals his judgment, the good. He takes bread and breaks it. 
saying, this is my body given to you. Would you remember this? Always. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant. It's a marriage covenant. In my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And do it in remembrance of me. And now, who do you love? If the answer is him, that's called faith. Take a piece and drop it in your garden. <laughs> and so, Lord God, we thank you that you are love and you never fail. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are our helper. And Lord God, I thank you this morning for uh, my helper. Susan, it seemed right to thank you for her as we celebrate 30 years of walking, technically, officially, with a piece of paper together for 38 years. And yet, Lord God, even as I'm speaking, I'm looking out and seeing two friends in particular that recent lost their, recently lost their helper, good helper. And yet, Lord God, you were the goodness in that helper. And you're also the one that says, look, I gave you my only begotten son. Will I not give you all things with him? And so, God, I thank you that we get all these helpers back. And yet, when we get the helpers back, we realize that they were helpers because our help is in them. And you never leave us. You never forsake us. And so, Father, there are a lot of people in this room that have always wanted a great helper and think they don't have a helper. There are other people, Lord, that had a helper for a while and their helper cheated on them or maybe they cheated on their helper. They're confused. The people, Lord, people confused about what exactly helper is. But I pray for all of us that we'd remember you're the helper. And after you reveal that you, in fact, are the helper, you give us all things. So, Lord God, thank you for walking with us. Thank you that nothing happens by chance. And thank you that you're always whispering into your heart. Now, now who do you love? Lord God, I thank you that the answer um, is good. Because you are good. In Jesus' name, we see it, and we believe it, and we say thank you. Amen. Now, if you're new to the sanctuary, let me just say, if you'd like to discuss the sermons, we've been doing this chew the fat thing just online, you're invited to join us. You can, I'll send you a link if you just send me um, an email. Also, let me say, if you're new to the sanctuary, some of these things might be kind of uh, unfamiliar, and I think that's because Christians have not taken the Bible literally. We've taken our judgments and our perceptions of space-time literally, but now even physicists like Albert Einstein say, look, you cannot take space-time literally. In his words, it's a strongly persistent illusion. What you need to take seriously, or literally is a bad word because it means different thing to different people, but what you need to take seriously is the one who's walking with you. You're on a walk. Nothing happens by chance. God is constantly asking you, who do you love? And he is constantly creating a response within you, and that's called faith. So talk to him. Just talk to him. And don't get stuck. Trust him. Now, if you just thought to yourself, I, I want to trust him, check this out. You didn't think that thought. So much as 
that thought just thunk you. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is thinking you into existence. <laughs> so say, thank you, and you're no longer stuck. Another way to say that would be simply, believe the gospel in Jesus' name, amen. And now listen, if you'd like prayer, members of the prayer team would be down front. They'd love to sit here and pray with you. You're invited to just stay here for a minute. You might want to wait until this one song is over, and then you can come down forward for, for prayer. Amen? Miles of barbed wire, got a cool snake for a nip tie. Brand new house on the roadside, it's made out of rattlesnake hide. Got a brand new chimney that I put on top, it's made out of human skull. Come on, take a little walk with me, child, and tell me who do you love?